perhaps the national leader, one of the leaders out there on preventing amputations is Dr. Fadi Saab. He's the Chief Operations Officer for Advanced Cardiac and Vascular Amputation Preventative Centers. He's out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's been a personal friend and mentor to me. I've learned so much from him. He co-directs the AMP meeting, the Amputation Prevention Meeting, yearly. And it's essentially the largest meeting of its kind uh, worldwide that's dedicated to preventing limb loss and amputations. And Dr. Saab uh, and his colleagues have really pioneered a lot of the techniques that we now use to do limb salvage. So thank you, Dr. Saab. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Anand, for the kind words. And uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's really refreshing to see uh, uh, the amount of enthusiasm and uh, um, and the interest from everybody in, in, this, in, this, in this topic. Uh, these are my disclosures, and um, it's kind of my talk outline. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit spoiled here. We, we never get 24 minutes to give a talk, so that's, that's, uh, that's really good, so thank you. Um, uh, I hope I can uh, um, add a little bit to the information that's provided to you today. So we're gonna talk about CLI and chronic kidney disease and its prevalence. Uh, CLI patients, outcomes with chronic kidney disease, disease patterns and revascularization modalities, and ultimately what, what we think, uh, what people like Anand and myself think is the future direction of, uh, for this deadly disease. I love what Anand said earlier, that every patient that receives an amputation is a failure uh, from us as healthcare providers, and each and every one of us. And until we start recognizing this, we're not gonna be able to tackle this disease. It's the only disease where this modality of treatment, it's called a modality of treatment, amputation is called a modality of treatment, is still acceptable in the 21st century. So hopefully we can make a dent in that. Uh, this, is a, this is a slide that uh, goes along with everybody we were talking about uh, earlier today in terms of a correlation between advanced, uh, um, advancing age, uh, uh, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. These patients have peripheral vascular disease and furthermore, they have critical limb ischemia. Well, the prime registry is the first critical limb ischemia registry in the United States with the sole focus on enrolling patients with critical limb ischemia. And I'll talk a little bit about the importance of having registries for CLI patients and why do we need to have registries for CLI patients and we don't have enough of those. Um, just to give you an idea, when we looked at a sample of 500 patients, those are PVD patients, including CLI patients, about 43% of our patients had greater than or equal stage three chronic kidney disease. And if we looked at only CLI patients, this is the first 350 patients published uh, uh, outcomes of uh, uh, patients within, within the prime registry. We have more than 1,000 patients right now. But if we looked specifically at those patients, we found that that number increased up to about 60% or so. So when you look at peripheral arterial disease, claudication pa patients, and um, if you look at the literature, everybody suggests that CLI is only one to 2% of those, that patient population. I don't think, anecdotally, I don't think that that number is clear, and if I try to track that number back, it takes me back to paper after paper after paper, all the way back to the 60s, and I can't pinpoint that number, what it came from, because in reality, I think there's, more CLI than, than what's documented in literature. But if you look at PAD patients and we look at the distribution of a disease, what we call SFA popliteal region above the thigh, it's about 37% of the lesions. And if you look at the lesions that are isolated to tibia vessels, which is vessels below the knee, it's about 19% of the patients. And if you look at multi-level disease, it's about 40% of the patients. That's peripheral vascular disease patients, that's your typical claudication patient that we're trying to improve their quality of life when we revascularize them. Well, when you look at CLI patients, critical limb ischemia patients, Rutherford class four, five, and six, patients that have breast pain and they have wounds, that picture changes a little bit. So about 20% of those lesions are in the SFA region, which is above the knee, and about 30% of the lesions are isolated tibial disease, basically lesions that are involved in, in, in uh, below the knee area, and about 40% of the lesions remain, 45% remain multi-level disease. That means above the knee and below the knee. Well, I mentioned that we need CLI registries because as a cardiologist, we've always been privileged in, and lucky enough to have trials that have 4,000 patients, 5,000 patients, 10,000 patients, 20,000 patients. But when it comes to peripheral vascular disease and critical limb ischemia patients, guess what are the number one enrollment criteria exclusion factor for a lot of those patients? Anybody guess? 
chronic kidney disease, renal failure. So if your patient is on dialysis, I'm not going to say all the trials, but if your patient is on dialysis or they have advanced chronic kidney disease, by default, they're out of those trials. That's number one. So, and number two, if you talk about technically uh, challenging lesions, the average lesion length in a lot of these randomized trials, which is how long is the blockage or how long is the disease in the vessel, is anywhere from between six to eight centimeters, okay, which is, which is, which is uh, um, a common thing uh, among those patients. Well, the average lesion length in the prime registry for patients that have claudication is about 200 millimeters, 20 centimeters. And the average lesion length, that's the average lesion length, in patients with critical limb ischemia is about 240 millimeters. The average lesion cutoff for randomized trials is about 120 to 150, 150 millimeters. Dr. Prasad and I, we always enroll patients in trials, and that's the number one limiting factor. So we are actually struggling to enroll patients in CLI trials because these patients are, uh, they're, they're, they're not healthy substrates. They have a lot of comorbidities, so by default, that excludes them from trial. And then the next hurdle that we have to get over is the fact that a lot of their lesions don't qualify for revascularization. So that's why we need registries to teach us about what we need to do with these patients. This is one of our papers where our group looked at, is there an association between ABIs and critical limb ischemia patients? And, and as Anam mentioned earlier, you know, we take ABIs with a grain of salt. In fact, I'm going to venture to say that ABIs, unfortunately, have been harmful in a lot of our patients' cases because the group of physicians and healthcare providers that are sitting here today, they're mindful of that. But there's a lot of our peers and colleagues out there that they're not necessarily aware that uh, ABIs might not be accurate for screening patients with critical limb ischemia in particular. The story continues. So this is the Kaplan-Meier uh, um, uh, diagrams looking at chronic kidney disease and short-term risk of mortality and amputation. Like everybody here was showing, the worse your kidney disease or the more advanced the stage of chronic kidney disease, the higher the rate of amputation and the higher rate of death. Now, I want to point your attention um, to, to this bottom graph here. Um, when I, whenever I look at that, I am always amazed. Um, you know, we've made such improvements in treatment of patients with cancer, especially breast cancer in the country. It's really uh, heartwarming to see the success rates. Look at the survival rates for patients with critical limb ischemia. We're only, uh, uh, it's only worse for patients with pancreatic cancer. So when I talk to my patients about critical limb ischemia and I tell them, uh, they tell me, you know, they're not taking things seriously and I need to give them a dose of reality and I say, I will say that this disease has worse outcomes than breast cancer. And suddenly everybody, you know, eyes and ears perks up and they take things seriously and they will be interested in talking to you about smoking cessation, taking care of their diabetes and taking care of their blood pressure. But not a lot of physicians out there that when you diagnose somebody with a critical limb ischemia, you're fighting against time, you're fighting against the clock. What about tibial disease in particular, even tibial disease? Tibial disease is disease involving vessels that are below the knee. This is kind of the next phase of challenge for endovascular specialists like myself, Dr. Prasad, that physicians that we fight on a daily basis to improve blood flow to areas that need to be treated within the foot. Well, it's the same story. Patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, they have the worst outcomes and the higher rates, uh, higher, highest rates of amputations in uh, limb loss. Our group conducted uh, an interesting study. I know there's a lot of patholo pathological slides, but this is very interesting. So, uh, because right now I would say the biggest challenge for us is dealing with patients with advanced end-stage tibial disease. That's disease involving these tibial vessels. They're small vessels. They're calcified. They're, they're negatively modeled. So what we did is, um, um, and I'll show the picture where you actually see this rail of calcium, and then you see a space. Rail of calcium, and then you see a space. And we came up with a, with a name for this, uh, for this phenomenon that you see on fluoroscopy. We'll call it the Ginelli gap. What we did, we, we actually took about 15 excuse me, 25 uh, cadaveric samples with severe calcification um, in the tibial vessels. And we performed high-resolution uh, high x-ray imaging. This kind of x-ray imaging is not allowed in clinical practice anymore. It's only for research purposes. It's just I, I, I was told that uh, uh, in the 60s and the 40s, these machines used to be available in shops where they fit your, where your feet with shoes. Uh, but uh, now it's illegal to use it on patients. But nonetheless, 
If you look at the areas that are bright, this is calcium, and the areas that are not bright is what we call the Ginelli gap. It's right here, and the dark areas here is, is the calcification. So interestingly, when you look at the Ginelli gap, what happens is basically the areas always lack calcium. There's only speckling of calcium. There's severe calcification before and after. It's almost like the vessel is fractured. It's fractured and it's elongating and it's negatively being modeled. So if it's hard to go through the calcium, it's much more impossible to go through those very fibrotic and difficult to cross lesions. And we notice that this phenomena actually it develops or it's, it's uh, hyperinflated within the distal tibial circulation around the ankle area and the distal third of the lower extremity, which is a very er difficult area for us to, to work through and uh, cross these lesions and treat these lesions because the vessels are small, smaller, they're negatively modeled, and it's a high stress mechanical area, right? Our ankle is moving all the time. It's very, very challenging to treat and go around. So beyond treatment of SFA lesions, uh, that's lesions in the, in the thigh area or lesions in the popliteal area or lesions in the proximal tibial vessels, there is a huge shift in focus right now on what we call pedal loop reconstruction, basically improving blood flow within the circulation within the foot itself. If these are vessels within the foot itself, then these vessels are responsible ultimately for nourishing and supplying blood flow and oxygenation to these lesions where our podiatry colleagues need to, to heal those patients. They need good blood supply for those patients. So, We're going to get a little bit technical here. I thought it might be interesting for, for some to look at some of the things that we have to go through in order for us to, to improve blood flow for those patients. So when we're talking about improving blood flow, these are very, very small vessels. Sometimes they're 2 millimeters, 2.5 millimeters in a, on a good day. Um, and if they're, if they're, if they're negatively remodeled, uh, they can get smaller than 1 millimeters. So remember what I showed you about the pictures with the proximal calcification and, and the, the, the vessels distally that are negatively remodeled. Uh, we have to assess these vessels. There's a lot of revascularization modalities out there that we can utilize to treat, these, to treat these lesions because it really depends. If you have heavy calcification, which is like the dark area, the tool that you need to use it might be different from an area that you have atheroma or hypoechogenic space. So there are multiple devices, um, and I think they're beyond the scope of what I'm going to try to do today, but I'm going to give you a sample of those devices that are actually aiding us in, in, in beating this, this very challenging uh, type of disease. They all have different uh, modalities of uh, mechanisms of actions, and um, the more you are, the better you're able to evaluate these lesions and their morphology, and, and, and uh, the, the, better you, the better equipped you are, in terms of choosing a device to treat. So let me, let me show you a case of a, a patient that we had to treat, 69-year-old uh, gentleman that presented with an unhealing wound over the plantar and dorsal aspect of the great toe, multiple risk factors. I think somebody earlier was asking about patients with an EF 25%. We cannot enroll these patients in trials. This patient, by default, is not going to qualify to be uh, in, a, in a randomized research trial. Non-compressible ABIs. This is a picture of a wound uh, in the beginning uh, of it. In, this image here is basically the blood flow below the knee. So this is the popliteal artery, gives you the posterior tibial artery, perineal artery, and the anterior tibial artery. And the image on the left here, I'm sorry, on the right here, is basically the plantar circulation. So this is a vessel that goes to the bottom of a foot, and you're supposed to have a vessel that goes to the top of the foot all the way to that great toe. So even though you see blood flow in the foot, this patient still has a wound because they don't have adequate blood supply to that ischemic area, sort of the angiosome concept. So now you can tie the outside on the inside. So ultimately what we end up doing for, for those patients is we use special catheters and wires. These wires are 14 of a thousand thin. It's almost like thinner than the, the, than the hair. And we use special equipment, special devices, and try to go through these occlusions all the way down to where the vessels are supposed to be. And um, we're, we, we can't stop there. So this concept of pedal loop reconstruction is having continuous blood flow from the posterior circulation to the anterior circulation and vice versa. Right here, what you're seeing is the, um, uh, we're manipulating the wire to go through the tarsal branch. This is about one millimeter vessel right here. And we're able to manipulate these wires all the way back to the posterior circulation. 
And we're using a device here called the laser device. If you notice the fluoroscopic image, you don't see the rails that we were describe, describing earlier. It tends to be a less of a calcific, calcific lesion, has atherosclerotic disease. It does have calcium, but it's not as severe as the heavily atheroma. So we're able to modify the vessel. We're able to treat the vessel all the way down to the dorsalis pedis artery, which is a very, very small vessel. And ultimately, we were able to um, place what we call a balloon, balloon basically to inflate, to push that plaque out of the way. And um, just to give you an idea, the lesion length in the foot, I, I call this the matrix view, so um, if, you're a, if you're a movie uh, geek like me, so that's, uh, that's for the people that watch the matrix. So you know, you, you take the camera and you rotate it, and as you can see here, you think that, the, that uh, any occlusion in the foot should be short, right? This is a 200 millimeter, it's about 20 centimeter length balloon that tells you that these lesions are long. Also, by default, these lesions will be excluded from research trials. And we actually will take small balloons, about two millimeter balloons, 2.5 millimeter balloons, and we will stretch these vessels because we would like to maintain um, ultimately that patency between the anterior circulation and the posterior circulation. So if you notice here, you know, four years ago, five years ago, we will only take this picture and be very satisfied that we have blood flow in each vessel. But in reality, we need to look at this picture here, where if you remember the earlier picture, we had blood flow in the posterior circulation. Now we have blood flow in the anterior circulation, and off of that, off of that anterior circulation, you see these digital branches. In fact, we're able to uh, perform balloon angioplasty on the first digital branch, not the smaller branches within the toes, but the first digital branch. This is how much our technology is improving and moving forward. So we're able to help a lot of those patients with, with the most challenging disease. You know, saying that there's no options is not acceptable anymore. This is another example of a patient that has a transmetatarsal amputation. Uh, there is multiple types of these pedal loops. There is proximal pedal loops and distal pedal loops, but this patient had a transmetatarsal amputation that's not healing. So ultimately what we decided to do is, again, perform that pedal loop, have a continuous circulation between the anterior portion of the foot and the posterior portion of the foot. And in this particular case, we used another device called, called an orbital atherectomy device. It's a device that has a uh, diamond coating on it. And before you get excited, they're not real diamonds, because I already asked. But, um, but synthetic diamonds, so they're actually uh, abrasive. So they're actually uh, performing an abrasive uh, uh, function on the calcific nature of a vessel, thus modifying the compliance of a vessel. So when we perform balloon angioplasty, we're able to achieve adequate results. So when, when, when you see this dark, thick line, that's good. That's contrast that's moving through an open vessel, delivering oxygenated blood to the tissue. Another option, so this image you see here on the right is basically what we call a Doppler signal. It's a, it's a non-invasive non, non modality that's basically showing us that there's, this is a flat line. There is no blood flow. If there's blood flow, you see spikes, you know, boom, boom, you know, spikes of blood flow through the vessel. So you don't see that. So with our technology right now, I want to point it at your attention to one thing here. If you look at the left, this is basically the occluded posterior tibial artery around the ankle area. And because, we're, because these patients have chronic kidney disease, advanced renal failure, something that we incorporate in our practice, and a lot of endovascular specialists are adopting right now, is utilization of ultrasound imaging because I am able to see the vessel even though it's, there's no blood flow through it, and I'm able to insert our catheters and wires in, and um, techniques through it, thus ultimately achieving revascularization for the patient and improving outflow for the patient. So if you look here, this whole segment was occluded, um, and now we have blood flow in, in the vessel. We did not have any blood flow before, and at 30 days, you see these spikes of blood flow through the vessel, thus providing oxygenated blood to that region. So this is kind of the next phase in terms of critical limb ischemia therapy, working all the way down to the, to the wound level within the foot itself, not improving blood flow in the proximal segments in the thigh or behind the knee, and hoping for the best for the patient. We need to go beyond that stage anymore. In current technologies, the samples that I showed you, like laser atherectomy or orbital atherectomy, there are other modalities uh, that we can talk about. So what I was referring to earlier in terms of not using a lot of contrast for patients, we can actually utilize ultrasound to guide and deliver therapy for those patients. 
So in this example here, this is a very, very thin wire. And we can see that there's, there's an occlusion here with the calcium and the wire is actually moving beyond the occlusion, moving away from the occlusion on that area. I don't need contrast to do that. There are other modalities uh, to treat patients. Traditionally, we access the groin area for a lot of those patients. But now there's other modalities where you can access occluded vessels in the thigh area, you can access occluded vessels in the ankle area. And those modalities is something that's a must. Um, this, these, these modalities in, in your region, in your area, you have to seek out the physicians that are able to do this. So if I have a patient here, I know Dr. Prasad and, and his team, uh, Dr. Ahmed, they have a great CLI program. They're able to utilize these techniques to revascularize patients. This should be the standard of care in a lot of the CLI centers around the country. Amputation should not be the standard of care for a lot of those patients. These techniques where we utilize ultrasound to visualize the vessels, this is an occluded vessel, decreases the amount of contrast, decreases the amount of radiation that you're exposing the patient to. But, you know, there are still limitations. So this is an example of an occluded dorsalis spedis artery. You can see what we call the white stop sign. We call it the white stop sign because there is acoustic shadowing, there is no clear layers, versus this example here where you can see layers of the vessel. I, I recognize that a lot of you probably don't look at these vessels all the time, but this, this bright speckled appearance is usually not a good thing. And this is how it looks under ultrasound. This is an example of one of the wires that we're using and you can see that it's basically getting outside the vessel because it's not able to penetrate that calcium because there's basically bone new genesis in that vessel there. You're not able to go through it. So what do we do for these patients? Are they done? Is there, is there no other treatment modality that we can, we, can, we can offer these patients? These are usually called the desert foot patients. Basically, all these vessels are pacified, they're calcified, there's nothing we can do about it. So are we done? Is there anything we can offer those patients? And the good news is we're not done. There are, there are some new treatment modalities that are out there, some new technologies that are out there that are currently being evaluated. Um, and every, every one of us um, is, is very interested in this modality. So this is an example of what we call the desert foot. You can see, you're supposed to see these dark lines extending all the way down to the toes. This is after we inject about 20 cc's of contrast or 15 cc's of contrast. You don't want to inject that much, but sometimes it's necessary, especially if a patient has chronic kidney disease. But if you notice, there's no dark lines in the foot. This is what we call desert foot. It's completely destroyed vessels. There's no architecture anymore. These vessels are pacified on ultrasound guidance. So this concept of deep vein arterialization has been, has been available since the 40s and the 50s where the surgeons used actually to connect the arteries into the vein. But that kind of died around that time. Now, we revive this concept again. So what we do is we use a device where we place a balloon in the vein and we place a device in the artery. The arteries and the veins are connected. They usually, um, uh, their paths are parallel all the way down to the foot. And what we, did, what we decide to do is we take a patient like this with a desert foot where you cannot see any contrast in the foot itself and we divert blood flow from one of the arteries into one of the tibial veins. So now the arterial blood, oxygenated arterial blood flow is going from the artery into the vein into the foot itself. And everybody is wondering in their head, wait a second, so how is the blood going back to, to, to the heart because you just use the vein? Well, the good news is we have about three miles of veins just below the knee area. Each artery is surrounded by two, sometimes three veins. And we're only utilizing one of those veins below the, below the knee area. There's new technologies uh, currently being evaluated in the United States. This is one of our early AV reversal patients. It's one of my patients. Um, this is at seven days when we reverse them. This is at 30 days. And at two years, I just saw him last week. This is a large vein when his foot is dangling down. You see it, when his foot is up, you, you don't see it anymore. And, um, and the pathway is still open. This is some of the new technologies that are being evaluated right now. This is called a lymph flow device. Uh, this is an example of a desert foot where you don't see any blood flow within the foot itself. Um, and this device, basically, you take the balloon and you place it in the vein. You take another device and you place it in the artery. And you use this device uh, to basically connect through a needle from the artery into the vein and ultimately deliver blood flow all the way down to the foot, as you can see here. 
And we use special we use special balloons and special stents that allows us basically to to place it within within the foot itself, and ultimately we end up with this blood flow as you can see here, being diverted all the way from the artery into ultimately into the vein in the foot itself. So in conclusion, patients with chronic kidney disease and CLI carry a poor prognosis, unfortunately. However, revascularization in these patients is still, um, it's more, it's feasible, uh, it's improving, and we're beating uh, each one of those challenges one day at a time, one challenge at a time. And the current technologies are allowing us more detailed treatment. However, the impact on patient outcomes need to be tracked and monitored. That's why registries like the CLI registry, prime registry is important. And ultimately, optimization of risk factors may impact outcomes for those patients. So, stop here. Thank you.